Hello my soccer universe. Well, I wanted to get my next induction into my soccer hall of fame. Um, and I know that I kind of was thinking, yeah, we had not two, we had a legend, we had an idol. Um, I want to have Austria in there and I want to have coaches in there. And I was going back and forth and I was almost about to do induct an Austrian player in my into my hall of fame. But then it happened that this week, Feyenoord's triumph in the European Cup uh, had its 50th anniversary and the coach of that one was the great Ernst Happel who anyway was bookmarked by me to be my first inductee in my Hall of Fame as a coach as he is easily the best coach that ever came from Austria the greatest football rating personality that ever came from Austria but in addition, he's one of the greatest coaches of all time, period. Um, when he, and I wish I could say retired, when he died, he was the coach with the most recognized titles worldwide ahead of Trapattoni. That in itself. I mean, he meanwhile, he has been overtaken. Um, I think he has been overtaken by Trapattoni for sure. Um, so yeah, um, but at the time he was the greatest. He's also, and we'll talk about his achievements, he's also the first coach to win the European Cup, what is now the Champions League, with two different teams. Uh, that is something that has, that has uh, Hitzfeld has done, I think Mourinho has done, and a couple of others, but um, it's the big achievement. He's the first one. And to boot, um, he also uh, is kind of one of the founding fathers of uh, fathers of what we call total football. Uh, it's all associated with Ajax. The legend goes that he introduced the four three three with Feyenoord, and when uh, Ajax was still playing four two four, there was a lucky draw between Feyenoord and Ajax where Michael Stendrist, okay, he also had to play 4-3-3. Happel's style was a lot more offensive in going forward, whereas um, Ajax was a little bit more deep-lying and playing on the counter-attack. So, uh, and he, I think his biggest achievement is that he has a lot of forward-thinking football. He had the, he introduced the offside trap at a time when this was virtually unheard. Uh, he uh, got this in the Netherlands first, he introduced it to, to, to Belgium, and in the 80s he introduced it to Germany. Germany at that time was man-to-man, -man, all man-to-man. -to -man. They didn't even think about going for an offside trap. And he introduced that uh, technical concept that uh, everyone's taking for granted right now uh, also the high press uh, or the pressing style at, at, at the time was unheard of he was always uh, get um, numerical advantages all over the place press your opponents maybe not as extreme as now but there was definitely a lot of pressing going in his uh, playing uh, the style that he had had played and of course he was one of those co co coaches that he said I'd rather win 5-4 than 1-0 uh, that from a coach is considered one of the greatest tacticians of the game is a remarkable statement. I also think uh, what's le legendary is that he was a man of few words. Um, he introduced all these high tackle concepts for the time, not through uh, explaining and, and tinkering and, and, and whatever. He made it in training sessions. He let the players explore this with the ball. He himself was a very gifted soccer player for Austria in the 50s. Um, I will touch on his uh, player career in a second as well. But uh, the amazing thing is that he didn't need to talk a lot. I think um, one of his famous halftime speech, uh, pre-match speeches was at the, ahead of the 1978 World Cup final when he was coaching the Netherlands where he said, gentlemen, two points. And that was that. So basically, gentlemen, win. Uh, so he was not, he was also someone who, and I think when I heard this, uh, it changed my perspective. He said, I will never complain about the referee. They have it hard enough. I don't need to do that. So, you know, a uh, lot of integrity. He, because of his quiet um, way of not saying much, and if he said, said something, he came across as kind of gruff a little bit, sometimes even a little bit um, offensive. 
he had this kind of attitude that he's a strict disciplinary, which he in a way was, but you know, uh, very unfriendly, but he was not, his players usually loved him, absolutely adored him. And uh, when you see now um, documentaries on him, when former players talk about him, they usually talk about him as the second coming. Uh, so um, he was very well loved. Yes, he was a rough coach, but he was not one to really um, go against the players. He gave the players, at least on the field, a lot of a lot of freedom. So yeah, but in order to understand uh, Hubble the coach, um, you have to hear a little bit about Hubble the player. He was a child of, uh, you know, he grew up in. Uh, at Rapid in the in 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 the forties, during war times more 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 or less, uh, he actually was about to be. Um, he fled, I think, Vienna. Came back. A very, uh, very obscure stories where he kind of uh, he he went all the, all the way to Germany and then took him months back uh, to come back or something like that. But he quickly started uh, play playing again and was probably one of the most. Uh, successful rapid sides of all time. He is a kid in from Vienna uh, through and through uh, and if you know a little bit about Vienna you understand the character of uh, Ernst Happel a whole lot better. Uh, he played all his career at Rapid except for one season where he played at the Racing Club uh, de Paris. Um, Basically, his biggest success was that he was the what we, we would call the sweeper for the Austrian national team when Austria uh, finished third. However, that also broke his relationship kind of with Vienna because he was blamed for the 6-1 defeat in the semi-final against Germany, where Austria was considered actually favorites and were thinking of going to the World Cup final. Uh, that is a game that... Uh, you know, that were all work, especially Austria's place in it, I, is a whole other video. But basically, he took this criticism very, very hard. He was a player who had no discipline whatsoever. He liked to be uh, tough on his coaches. Uh, one of his coaches even said that he wishes that he will once become coach and then will have to deal with players like him. Which came true then, <laughs> the latest that Feyenoord. not. Um, he also kind of, uh, you know, there are some anecdotes about him that in a um, test match for the 1954 World Cup, uh, Austria already up by 13 goals or something like that. His best buddy was the goalie and uh, who was known as this hero, the Panther from Glasgow and the Tiger from Budapest, something like that. And during, during, during the game, he simply got, got bored and the ball comes his way. He stops the ball with his butt, turns around and scores an own goal. Entirely on pur purpose to call his uh, buddy off guard and then kind of say, Who are you? Who are you? You're the da 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 from uh, Hütteldorf, which is the district of Vienna that uh, Rapid is from. Uh, just one of those things. Probably his most famous game came in the European Cup, I want to say in 56. Or something. It's one of his last games where, um, yeah, 56 against Real Madrid, the twice defending champions at the time, um, where Rapid uh, lost the first game at the Bernabeu 4-2 and then back in Vienna, he scores three goals against Real Madrid as a defender. Uh, the return game should have been played on neutral ground, however, um, Rapid said, oh, we got to take, take one, have, have, have you played in Madrid? And so Rapid was eliminated and no away goals rule back then. He was close to be uh, bought by Real Madrid, but they went to for Santa Maria instead at that time. But basically, with all the 54 thing, he had kind of, you know, in Vienna, he was not seen all that well anymore. So he started his trainer career, actually, of all places in the Netherlands. He just went away at Den Haag, who had been kind of always uh, close to relegation. He made them into a title contender. He never won the title, but he reached, I think, four cup finals, winning the final one in 68, which was a huge deal at the time. 
and kind of showed the big boys Fener or the Ajax, you know, uh, this is how you, how, how you play. And he terminated his contract after the 69 season, after he kind of had a tussle with the president, which opened Feyenoord, who just had become two double winners to f put their current coach as the youth coach and hire Happel. And Happel could not have had a better start to his uh, career at Feyenoord. He wins the European Cup. First, uh, probably one of his must, Masterox eliminating the reigning champions, Milan. Yeah, not that happy about that one. Milan actually one of the few teams that he didn't go to. He was some once ru rumored to, uh, to uh, coach Milan, but uh, it didn't make it. He also had some loose connections with Real Madrid that never actually materialized. So yeah, he, uh, that, that's also part of the security. He could have been in much higher regard had he really coached one of these super, super, super clubs. There's also uh, a tale that he potentially could have managed uh, Napoli and Maradona, but he wanted, he wanted to stay in Hamburg. Anyway, um, he goes on to win the European Cup in a cup final uh, against Celtic, where they were outsiders. Uh, yes, they had eliminated Milan, but uh, other, other, other than that, they had a relatively easy way to the final. If you look at um, uh, opponents where Celtic had not only eliminated Benfica, but also Leeds, who were seen as the big favorite of this um, uh, of the um, uh, competition. Uh, they went out, were underdogs, but he outsmarted. He quickly re realized the Celtic is playing only one way, very, very quick, go on the flanks and so on. And he played the f uh, kind of modern way, short passes, uh, keep the ball, um, be fluid. And they had more chances and 1-1 one, one, the final and then it went to overtime where they again had, uh, Feyenoord had the better chance and, and Ove Kindwell the 17th actually gets the winner. I just watched the highlights. I urge you to do the same because the most amazing thing in those highlights is when Kindwell scores the winner, all the reporters, the photographers are running onto the field to take it. And I've seen this uh, at World Cup highlights from the 60s and, and so on as well. Absolutely amazing to think about this uh, these days. So go that one. He also won a championship with Feyenoord in 71 and but he actually quit Feyenoord just at the time when he got too comfy with his players because he said this uh, will kill discipline. Speaking of discipline, the big player of Feyenoord at the time was definitely Wim van Hanegem and he was the player that kind of ruffled his feathers because he had no discipline. He was gifted uh, like nothing before, but he was definitely one of those where Hubble was kind of saying, yeah, um, please follow my orders. But they were always a little bit like uh, cat and dog. In the end, uh, when you hear Van Hanneken talking about uh, Hubble these days, he says uh, it's, he was just a wonderful coach. Of course, it's that's what it is. He had a short uh, stint at Sevilla, which was not all that successful. <laughs> Segunda back then, and then he went to uh, Club Bruges, where he won three titles in, in a row comfortably, every time ahead of Anderlecht. In addition, he reached two cup final, Euro European Cup Finals, uh, losing in 1976 uh, to Liverpool in the, European, in, in the UEFA Cup Final, I think. It was a 4-3 or something like that. And two years later against the same opponent at Wembley. Yeah, tough. Uh, Liverpool at Wembley losing 1-0. Club Bruges at that time was one of the best teams in Europe thanks to his coaching. Uh, at the same time he also started to coach the Dutch national team. Uh, ahead of the 78 World Cup he could not convince Cruyff to play. And it seems there was ahead of the tournament because he could not play, he could not coach in the qualification because they had to play against Belgium and the Belgian Federation did not allow Hubble because of conflict of interest to uh, coach an opponent. I mean, he had, had a say, but he couldn't really coach. So yeah, um, that was one thing. And then his assistant kind of was really liked by the players. So I've read stories that there was a revolt and they kind of kept it under check that uh, Happel is the nominal coach 
uh, there, but it was much more of a team um, experience. And yeah, if Rob Rensenbrink makes and uh, doesn't hit the post but hits the goal, the Netherlands might have won that title. And Ernst Happel, who had in Austria the title world master, which means world champion, in a dialect like the way he would have been an actual world champion. He never became a world champion. Um, on the other side, he himself said if he would have scored that goal, this was all geared towards Argentina winning, um, they would have played another 20, 20 minutes until it goes to overtime. Then he kind of hit a little bit, I don't want to say the skits, but after, you know, uh, uh, yeah, uh, the one final <laughs> funny thing is when he came back from the uh, from the World, World Cup, there was the big um, meeting with the Queen of the, ne of the Netherlands and he's telling to the young Prince Willem Alexander, because the Queen is a little bit late, uh, boy, when is Omar coming? Because I need, need, need to go to the casino in Carinthia. That was his. Uh, that was one of his two big um, vices: casinos, playing cards, and smoking like crazy. Uh, there's hardly any picture of Happel where I don't see him smoking and smoking really hard stuff. I mean, uh, hard cigarettes. He, he never did any um, drugs. Walt, Walt, so, but you know, he took a time out after this. Uh, took to a few jobs, uh, among others, uh, Sana de Liege uh, again. In 78, Hamburg, who had the new manager, Günther Netzer, tries to hire him, but he has no license, so he cannot be hired. There was a much bigger problem, though. Happel salary. And Günther Netzer, who is one of his biggest fans and still says the best coach that he ever uh, had to be with, he said he wants to have that much money for his salary. And... Uh, yeah, he said we can do that, and then he's and then he figured, um, and then they fig figured out. Yeah, when Hamburg said they can do that, they meant gross salary. He always meant net salary. He didn't care about gross salary with the tax um, rates, but that at that time in Germany, that was not easy. But as since Köln could hire Rinus Michels, he also without a license, Hamburg then could pounce and get Ernst Happel. And had the most successful time uh, at the time. He lost the UEFA Cup final against Göteborg, which I, is still an unbelievable feat to me. But he becomes German champion in his first year and his second year also. And he wins the European Cup for a second time with Hamburg against Juventus, where again they are big outsiders. However, he sees that Juventus is using man to man. He does the trick switches uh, defenders around, creates a lot of space on one side, especially for Maga to exploit, who takes the shot, wins it, and Juventus cannot come back into the game. And Hamburg have the biggest success in history, winning 1-0 against a highly, highly, highly favored Juventus team. Uh, still in Hamburg, he's like in Rotterdam, seen as a soccer god. Uh, he also, I think Bayern recently broke that record. I think they also went uh, more than, I want to say 36 or 38 games unbeaten. Let me just check if I um, can find this here. No, not quickly, but uh, he went a long, uh, he went a long unbeaten run. Um, and yeah, after his he stayed until 87 in Hamburg. He was quite comfortable then, especially in conjunction with Netzer. The story is he always made his um, uh, training camps close to a casino. Uh, both of them liked that, so uh, there was always the casino lobby there. So yeah, he was not only... Uh, I mean, he was obsessed with soccer, but he also knew kind of the good life in a way. But then... In, he wanted to go back and then he went uh, to Tyrol back to Austria. So he had won championships in the Netherlands, in Belgium, in Germany. He went to Austria to Swarovski Tyrol, who were the big team at the time. Similar to what Red Bull is today, uh, but not as commercial in a way. Um, and he won two more championships with them in 89 and 90 um, and also the double. The one thing is that there, 
Uh, he did not feel as at home as he would have been in Vienna, you know, in the mountains, uh, the whole thing. Yes, he enjoyed it, he was successful, but he also kind of became, that's where he really got the, um, uh, the rep reputation that he's only going for uh, endurance and strength trainings and so on. Um, and a year before he came in that season, Swarovski actually went until semifinals in the UEFA Cup, something which he never could achieve. Uh, on the other side, he even suffered his worst defeat in, I think it was 90 or 91, 9-1 uh, to Real Madrid. So yeah. In the meantime, he had been, I think, three, two times offered already the job as national team coach for Austria. Uh, once in 82, where it was really close, but then in the end the talks broke down uh, because the German FA, Austria was playing a group with Germany, said, no, we cannot have that. In 1990, Josef Hick Hickesberger, uh, as a young coach, brought Austria to the World Cup to Italy. He wanted to give it straight to Happel. He said, I don't want to get, you know, I don't want to uh, lessen your achievement by you not let, by not letting your coach in Italy. Um, yes, this is a, one of the big what ifs because Austria ahead of the World Cup played sensationally. As soon as they hit the World Cup stage, they completely broke down. There was suddenly uh, the stage that got too big, and it was a horrible World Cup in in a way. So everyone is kind of uh, yeah. Austria then really fell into, you know, losing the Faroe Islands and especially 1991, one of the worst years that I've seen for Austria ever. Especially coming from this high from uh, late 89 to uh, early 1990. And everyone was screaming, we need hapless coach who, uh, especially after he quit at Tirol. Uh, but he had his famous statement, I'm a patriot but not an idiot. Well, he became an idiot early in 92 and signed for the Austrian national team at this time already visibly sick. Uh, the guy who had kind of, you know, good full round, round face, it went more and more and more and more and more uh, like a skeleton. He still, as I said, in 91, the Austrian national team had a horrible year. He could instill some confidence in, in, into them. You could actually see that this, this this team is developing into something. And I remember the first time um, they played in Hungary, which was seen as a really tough match, but Austria played well, losing 2 1. Then they beat Lithuania 4 0, uh, 1 1 against Wales. Then they've only kind of. Uh, uh, hard, 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 you should understand someone from, from Vienna. No, because he said he's speaking a mixture between Austrian, Dutch, uh, Belgian, Northern German. No one un un understands what he's saying. But he said he was an excellent coach. And actually he asked, Beckenbauer asked uh, for Harpel's advice a few times when he became the national team coach, I think in 84, to kind of build his career. So there's another big connection to another nat nat national team. Um, Hubble's year in Austria was pretty much a farewell tour uh, in many ways because he then played, had a game against the Netherlands where the Netherlands were this absolute wonder team with the three Dutch stars, Gulli, the Reichert van Basten. They played in Sittard against Austria and win 3-2. I remember that match. The Dutch were clearly better, but that it was 3-2 was seen as a big, 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 big. Uh, so, so surprise, even, even more than one of the goal scorers was a former Dutch player uh, who got uh, Austrian nationality. Mean, meanwhile, I see him as, as an idiot, but back, back then I liked his uh, way. I saw Happel as a coach on the 2nd of September 92, 
when they play against Portugal in Linz. And I remember watching that game and only watching the bench. And I was sitting more or less across and I said, there is Happel. There is Happel. I have to remember that. I've seen Happel. I think it was about 14, 15, turning about to turn 15 at that time. And this was kind of, whoa, here is Happel. The big messiah. Austria played well at a 1 0 lead. I think it was then 1 1. The big star of Portugal back then was Paulo Futre. But Luis Figo came on in the second half as a, sub as a substitute. Uh, then World Cup qualifying starts. It goes very bad in Paris, losing 2 0 to France in a scoreline that was flattering, I have to say. I think Austria had the fir first corner kick, I think, in the 85th minute or some, 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 something like that. Uh, Papa and Cantona scoring the goals. Uh, but day after my birthday, they beat Israel 5-2 in what turned out to be the final match in um, Happel's career where he was coaching. And as I said, it was a farewell tour, yeah, the Netherlands, he, France, he played in Paris, so the game was played in Paris. And then his last game would have been November, a friendly against uh, Germany. However, due to his heavy smoking, and you could see his sick uh, uh, carcinoma in his uh, belly exploded during that summer, and his days were clearly numbered. And yeah, he died in November, uh, four days before that match. And the, as the story goes, his assistant, Dietmar Constantini, who was from, from Tirol, uh, and he actually, uh, fun enough, he received all his treatments in Tirol. Although he was not entirely 100% happy there, but you know, the good air and whatever. They were visiting him and they, they almost had a father-son relationship. And there is this big letter that he leaves for the Austrian national, national that he showed them that, you know, how to do it, that uh, you have to be proactive, you have to show courage and so on. And that's exactly what they showed on that day, uh, playing against Germany in 992, who just were still world champions, were still uh, were, um, just lost the, uh, Europe, the European Championship final to Denmark. They played in Nuremberg and Austria actually invited Germany in green. And if Tony Poster would have had a longer foot, Austria could have won that game in Nuremberg. They played with courage, a nil-nil draw that no one expected. Everyone expected Germany to roll over Austria at that point. And everyone said, yeah, this was Hubble's spirit. Yeah, his spirit was there. His cap was on the bench next to Dietmar Constantini. Uh, slightly sour note, everyone said that Constantini probably should have taken over the national team after, but he then went to Herbert Pohaska, who went to a little down period himself. He was buried in Vienna at the Zentralfriedhof, central, the big central grave, graveyard in an honorary grave for of the European uh, of the Austrian Football Federation. Uh, to the biggest honors, one can be bestowed. He is generally seen as the biggest football expert or the biggest football man in uh, Austria's history. Hugo Meisel might be in there. Uh, Probably, uh, but he had most of his successes in away from home and uh, in the Ladazio, I think the um, the president said that he was a European before that idea existed even in Europe and the Euro uh, Austria was at that time trying to get into in, into the European. He lived this multicultural life, you know, relocating to the Netherlands and kind of a little bit helping start a soccer uh, revolution there. In his honor, the biggest stadium in Austria is now called the Ernst Happel Stadium. Fitting is so, the only thing that does not fit, he is seen as a rapid player and the Ernst Happel Stadium is more often used by Austria, Wien, at least was, now they have their own stadium and so on. But it was more seen as an Austria venue than a rapid venue. But still, at that time, no one really cared because he was this overarching figure and he's more remembered as a coach than he is as a player that's for sure and he was a world-class player himself so with that and supple you are my first inductee to my soccer hall soccer universe hall of fame as in the category coaches and i will talk to you soon bye hey there I really hope you enjoyed this video and if you did, here are some videos and playlists that you might enjoy too. 
Also, please consider subscribing to my channel as it will keep you updated with all the things that rotate in my soccer universe. And with that, have a wonderful day. Bye.